Welcome to the final topic of the course of Applied Multivariate Statistics and this final topic is supervised classification. Today we will mainly deal with classification and regression trees. What is supervised classification? Supervised classification is first of all a classification technique that tries to explain known group memberships by variables, for example, environmental variables in the case of environmental science. Both supervised and unsupervised classification are actually special cases of supervised and unsupervised learning. Supervised learning in a general sense aims at inferring a function to predict given values of one or more response variables. For example, let's say you know which email is spam and you have a lot of terms in these emails, you may try to predict spam emails. That's a classic application of supervised learning. In the case of ecology or environmental science, we want to identify classification rules and may use them for explanation or prediction. Different Techniques or methods are known here. These include classification and regression trees, as already mentioned, discriminant analysis, artificial neural networks, but also generalized linear regression. As you have realized when we dealt with regression techniques, this is also aiming at explaining or predicting the, um, the based on one variable, the outcome of other, another set of variables of one or multiple response variables in the case of RDA, for example. Now, what are classification and regression trees, also called CART? They were introduced by Priman and Allen in 1984, a very classical book in this context, and they are used to predict um, used in prediction of a response variable to explain and explore patterns, for example, variable interactions and the relevance of environmental variables, um, or could be used for this, and for developing decision trees. Maybe you have not seen a decision tree before, now let's quickly look at the decision tree. This is how a decision tree looks like. And the research question in this study was which environmental variables determine whether the freshwater monospecidium SP spec is present or absent in the sampling site. So let's say we're interested in the distribution of this pesidium mollusk. And then we have this decision tree. It starts the root node, the so-called root node is connectivity. So connectivity would be the main predictor whether a mollusk, the mollusk is present or not. If the conductivity is higher than 550 microsiemens per centimeter, it's absent, otherwise it's present. Then oxygen content would be predictive of the absence or presence. Then ecotoxicological test data, presumably in the study, would determine whether the uh, in the absence of toxicity the species would be would be present and so on and so you go along this tree and you can predict or it's used to predict under these different environmental variables the outcome uh, of the presence or absence in a sampling site so that's one example for the application of this classification and regression trees so let's look a little bit at the terminology that is used for classification and regression trees. Why are we actually calling this trees? Well, this whole decision tree is called a tree, although it's a little bit odd because this tree throws, grows upside down. So you have here the root, the root node it's called, and it's split into different other nodes and each of these um, ends at the end with a terminal node that is also called leaf in the literature.
That's why we are calling this trees, because of you could see in this resemblance to the normal tree. Here is a overview that also gives some more information. We start with a root node, and this root node, in the case of regression trees, I will tell you a little bit later why that we have a distinction between regression and classification trees. This root node gives the mean and the number of observations in this case. For example, this is of the, the mean of the response variable that is used in the data set, and then this is split. We have seen in the previous example with the mollusk that the splitting rule is employed. For example, is the mollusk, mollusk at present or not, and this depended on connectivity. And then we move along this tree to no or yes, and we have another mean which would give the mean of the observations that are placed into the left part and that are, uh, that are assigned, placed into the right part of this tree. And this continues on and on until you reach terminal nodes, so-called terminal nodes. And in each node you have some information of the number of observations that are left. So, so all nodes, all child nodes and terminal nodes, when you sum them up, they, they add up to the initial number of observations, obviously. And this general procedure is mutual exclusive. This, that means one observation can either go left or right. It can only be part of uh, one node on one hierarchical level. Of course, an observation that is part of this terminal node would also be part of this node and the root node. So much about the different, the different terminological aspects and an overview of how such a tree looks like and what it, what it tells you. One aspect is that, that I've already mentioned is that you have continuous response variables. For example, you could have the, the um, as, as a continuous response variable, you could have the number of abund uh, the abundances of a species in the area as um, a categorical response variable would be the presence or absence of a species. So you have these different types of variables. And when you have abundances or the generally continuous variables, then you could use the mean of that, of that response variable after employing the splitting rule. And if you had categorical variables, you would use these. Now let's move on and look at the steps that are employed when building up a tree. First of all, you split the root node into two groups and you continue with this splitting all along until the terminal nodes. So what is done in this, this splitting? How do you decide which observations are placed in which node or which child node? Well, this splitting is done sequentially. You split always binary into two groups, so all are nested within each other from the root node to terminal node. And how you split is measured by some impurity measure. How pure is the node? What are the two nodes that are resulting? And it is the so-called deviance. And what you try to do, not too surprising perhaps, if you have followed all other parts of this course, is to minimize the deviance. So you search for the splitting of the observations in the two groups by minimizing the deviance. And how we can measure this will be explained later. So what we need to define here is some impurity or also good called goodness of split metric. The second part is that we need to stop tree building at some stage. And there are three criteria that can stop the 
the nodes from further splitting into further nodes and this can be on the one hand to define a minimum number of observations in a node. It's clear that if you have, for example, only 10 observations left in a node and the minimum number of observations in a node should be 8 or 10, then it's unlikely then you can have another split. In addition, it could be that all observations inside the node have an identical distribution, especially in the case of classification trees. In the case of classifications, you have probabilities over the different factor levels inside a node, and it's unlikely, and if you have all of them as identical distribution, then no further splitting is possible. Because if they are already of the same distribution, so let's say you have the distribution, uh, you have a categorical factor of, of high, low and, and no pollution and you have already um, a split, for example, the um, presence of a certain land use type like agriculture or industrial, industrial uh, uh, discharge. And you've already split this into a node where only non-polluted non sites are present, then further splitting makes no sense. And finally, you could define a maximum number of splits. Let's say you want to have maximum of 10, 5 or 10 splits. However, this is of course rather arbitrary. So what happens after tree building? after somehow the tree, tree is stopped from building through either of these criteria, you could reduce the size of the tree and this is called pruning. And it's often employed and it's based on a complexity parameter that penalizes increasing size in conjunction usually with cross-validation. Cross-validation you've heard heard about in other parts of this course and this complexity parameter is somehow similar to uh, penalties that you have that we had in a multiple regression context or in other context that the more variables you enter to a model um, gets penalized and here we have the more splits we have in a tree the more they, it is penalized. Let's look into this into more detail. So first we look at how we can measure impurity. We already defined that we have the so-called deviance and during the tree building the, of a parent node to two child nodes that we have, we calculate all possible splits. So let's say we have 15 observations here, 15 sampling sites and you want to split them into polluted and non-polluted sites. Um, this would be perhaps the split based on some environmental variable that is here selected. Then the computer automatically calculates how you can distribute the sites between the two nodes based on which environmental variables and um, calculates the deviance inside the parents and inside the parent node and inside the child nodes and it calculates then the difference between the deviance and the parent and child node and tries to maximize this. Maximization in this context would also just mean to have the minimum deviance in the child node, obviously. Okay, this is rather abstract still. It's somehow clear that we want to have lower variability in the child nodes than in the parent nodes. How do we measure this actually? And this is done differently depending on whether we have a nominal response variable. Let's say we have a variable that says um, that, that, that has um, no pollution or high pollution, although this could also be ordinal. Um, uh, we have uh, other variables that explain uh, a species has, has, has some trade. The trade could be, for example, low capacity 
or high capacity to disperse. And we have a continuous variable here on the right side, and this could be different ones as already discussed. Could be abundance of a species, it could be some chemical concentrations, it could be anything. It's clear that somehow we have to measure, you know, use different measures for a response variable that's on a nominal scale and one that's on a continuous scale. And for a nominal scale, we use the so-called Gini index. This Gini index is displayed here. First of all, it looks a little bit difficult to interpret, but it's actually very simple. So the deviance is calculated by, by calculating the sum of all observations actually a proportion of each observation is multiplied with 1 minus the proportion of the, of, the, of the observation in the class. So let's say we have here three factor levels. One factor level is a land use type, so we want to explain land use patterns, for example, from satellite imagery. Um, let's say we have, have in this the, the three classes natural land cover, agricultural land cover, and urban land cover, and we have different proportions in this node. If, for example, we had only, only one type of land cover, let's say we have 100% land cover, natural land cover, then this would sum up to one here, 1 minus 1, 0, 0 multiplied with 1 equals 0. And then we have the two other land cover types that are 0. They would, would you, you would put here 0, 0 multiplied with 1 is 0. So the deviance would be 0. That means if you have only, of all observations, if the proportion, if all observations are in one class, the proportion is, is 1. And this re yields to the minimum deviance. On the other hand, you could e you could see that if you have an equal distribution over the different classes in the node, let's say in, in, in the case of three, which if each of them makes up 33% of the observation, that would yield to the maximum deviance. So somehow this node or this deviance formula, this Gini index, measures how pure this node is. So is there the maximum deviance is if the, all the observations belong are equally distributed over all classes and you have the minimum deviance if all observations belong just to one class. On the regression side it's actually much easier, perhaps not too surprising for you. What you just do is you measure to observe the, the, the sum of squared differences between each observation and the total mean for that node. And this actually is the same as in other um, as for other techniques such as ANOVA, where you sum the mean, this and you could um, yeah, you, you even use the same terminology here, not too difficult to understand. So how can we select the optimal reduction in tree size? The deviance D is penalized by the cost complexity parameter that is given as the deviance plus the cost complexity parameter multiplied with the size of the tree. So what we see here is somehow when the size of the tree increases, then typically the deviance becomes smaller because we have more explanatory power. That's why we have splitting rules. We explain more variance, so the deviance decreases. But at the same time, this parameter, the second term here, complexity parameter multiplied with side of tree increases. So that's very similar to what we have known for the AIC, 
that we explain more variance, but we should be penalized for adding more splits here to the tree or adding more parameters to um, a regression model, for example, because in the end, otherwise, we could just add um, a very high number of splits and then explain a lot, but that's rather trivial and leads to overfitting. So the choice of this cost complexity parameter obviously determines the op op optimal tree size. The larger we set this cost complexity parameter, the larger is the penalty on the size of the tree and the smaller would be the optimal tree, so where we reach the, um, the um, minimum deviance based on the cost complexity parameter. However, this, the choice of such a cost complexity parameter is rather arbitrary, what we said there. So we need to think a little bit more, how can we end up with an optimal tree? And the answer here is cross-validation. How can cross-validation be used? What we do is we calculate the cross-validation error, and cross-validation you have known from other parts of this course, that means we remove some part of the observations and predict these observations from the remaining part of the, of the samples that we have. And we calculate this for different cost complexity parameters that are given here on the y-axis. And actually each of these cost complexity parameters uh, corresponds for this specific case to a uh, size of a tree. So if we would set the cost complexity, par complexity parameter to 0 0.024, then the optimal size of a tree would be 7. And we see um, based on the, of the cross-validation, we have here a point estimate of the cross-validation error and some standard errors for the cross validation error. So the first criterion to decide on the comp cost complexity parameter and related to this, to the size of the tree, is to choose the minimum cross validation error. So we take in this figure, we take the point estimate that yields to the lowest cross-validation error that this would have the highest prediction accuracy. So if you want to predict something, then here we would have the lowest error and we should use this complexity. It would be the size of the tree would be five. So this one would mean five terminal nodes we have or four splits. On the other hand, we could also choose a different or employ a different criterion and this is to choose the point estimate that is within one standard error of the minimum cross-validation error. Because you would say this is not significantly different, it's within one standard error of the minimum cross-validation error, but it's more parsimonious. So we have less parameters in the tree, we have less splits. This would be uh, four terminal nodes or three, plis, three splits. And it's similar to the choice in multiple regression analysis or in other types of modeling where we would say, well, if we want to explain something with the data, for example, what are the most important environmental variables, then we want to be more parsimonious and we don't care so much if we lose some predictive accuracy for novel, for novel observations that could be um, could be uh, predicted. So what are the advantages and, and disadvantages of classification and equation trees? First of all, they are very easy to interpret, including also interpretation of the importance of predictors. I have not shown this here, how the importance of predictors um, is obtained, but we will look at this in the R example. They are very powerful to deal with nonlinearity and with interactions. You can see that, for example, in the case 
With the monos, when you have more than 550 micro siemens, the uh, monos are largely absent. If it's below 550 micro siemens, they were absent under special conditions. So there's some interaction of conductivity with under with other variables, and this is very easy to model here and very easy to understand. Whereas including interaction terms in Linear models is much more difficult, also the interpretation. They are largely unaffected by outliers and you don't need data transformation for these techniques. And they can easily handle missing values. They use so-called surrogate values. You will see this in the R example. That's done automatically. However, they are also some disadvantages. For example, large trees are difficult to interpret. If you have many splits, it becomes difficult to really assign a meaning to these many interactions. You typically require many observations. So many observations means in the case, in one case in the literature, they used about 100 observations and for this case CART was actually more powerful than generalized linear model for uh, the logistic regression. Um, I haven't, it's, it's like always in statistics you can't give a definite number here how many observations are required, but you certainly should use something a minimum of 50, I would say. It depends, of course, as well on the number of variables that you have in the data set and so on. It's similar to multiple regression analysis, but you probably would rather need 20 or 30 uh, observations per variable that you include. Continuous variables are treated as discrete variables that can be a disadvantage because you may have continuous relationships that are not picked up here. Um, collinearity can complicate interpretation. Um, however, there are ways to deal with collinearity in the case of cards and for, during an extension of cards, such as boosted regression trees, if you have a lot of collinearity in the data. So it's uh, much easier than in the case of generalized or linear modeling. And finally, the problem is that the single tree is not very robust and not necessarily optimal. That means slight changes in including observations or leaving out observations can lead to very different trees. And this means that somehow this technique leads to overfitting. And Alternative, and you see more information in the, in the information, in the notes to the slide, would be conditional trees that don't have the selection bias. And the selection bias means that predictors with a higher number of distinct values are typically favored in these tree procedures. However, Techniques that are really alternatives to these trees, or well, they are not alternatives, but they are extensions, are random forests and boosted regression trees, and we will discuss them very briefly later. Let's stick to the topic of comparing generalized or linear models versus card. You have here an overview slide, I won't go through each of these, but you can see that cards are specifically strong if you have mixed data, explanatory variables, if you have missing values in your predictors, or if you have insens if, if you have some insensitivity to monotonic transformations of predictor, that means transformation is not required for your input data in card. Um, you are they are relatively robust to outliers and they are um, insensitive to irrelevant predictors, whether this is not the case for GLMs or also linear models. However, um, 
the automation is moderate compared to high for GLMs and the ability to model non-linear rela non -linear relationships is much better for card um, and also accommodation of interactions. Uh, there are of course again drawbacks, the model output um, is, is uh, a little bit more difficult to interpret at least. This is the, the judgment of Alden et al. Um, for GLMs um, and the software availability is a little bit um, is lower available and a little bit more difficult to use than GLMs. However, their predictive power is ranked higher. Another aspect um, that I've mentioned before is that CART typically requires larger data sets than GLM for meaningful results. Let's look um, under which conditions regression trees or generalized or linear models are better suited. Well, that depends actually on the data at hand. If your relationship between the predictors and response is linear, like shown as this example, where you have um, the relationship between x1 and x2, and these are the two shaded regions here that display the different parts of the data. Um, if this is linear, then the GLM or a linear model performs better. Um, so you see this, see this here that the card they do splitting, and splitting for the variable means that you have squared relationships. And this does not capture this linear uh, linear distinction between the two regions very well. So GLMs in this case would I would outperform regression trees. And in, in this in this lower case, you see, let's say we have a relationship here between x1 and x2 with squared regions. So uh, a linear model here would be not very suited to capture the relationships between two variables, whereas the, uh, the regression trees would capture this. So this is the example. Um, it depends on the data at hand what technique is more suitable. And you would actually see this when you run a parametric model like a GLM or LM. Um, when you do model diagnosis, this would tell you whether you have some problems regarding the linearity of your relationship and then you could run a regression tree. So what are the extensions? First extension I want briefly to discuss are random forest. We start with the problem that the trees are not robust and tend to overfitting. So this technique is actually resistant to overfitting and robust and it works by growing many trees. If you have many trees, you have a forest. So that's why it's called random forest. And you use this on a bootstrapped sample of training data. So you split up the data into some training data and test data, as mentioned before for other parts in this course, for other techniques. And then you also, at each of the splits of a tree, for example, at this node, this node, this node, you randomly select a subset of predictors, um, which is then used to build the tree. Um, we are not going into detail here why this is done. It's basically done for decorrelation. That means that the, since you select different environmental variables here in this node and in, in, in another tree, um, the trees are independent from each other and you can then have a better overview of the variable importance and the contribution to the final result and how good the respective tree is. Um, but we're not going more into details. Overall, random forest is one really of the best uh, and strongest techniques for classification, supervised classification and the results are generally less easy to interpret. Nevertheless, you have also information on variable of its importance 
um, that are provided by random, random forests, by this machine learning technique. A different technique is boosted regression trees, so different to random forests. You don't split up the data by bootstrapping uh, for the different trees, but you rather conduct sequential growing of trees where the following tree, the, the tree that is grown next, always focuses on the non-explained part or on the residuals or what is not well explained by the previous tree. So you have some kind of learning during tree growing and this leads to improvement of the accuracy. Typically the prediction accuracy is therefore higher than in random forests and of course than in single trees and the trees are smaller than in random forests uh, as well. The results are again less easy to interpret than in single trees. If you want to know more about boosted regression trees, they are a very really powerful technique, then um, you can click here, there's a hyperlink to the paper. Um, it's really recommended to read that paper and it's a really useful technique. Although we will rather focus on the uh, basic tree building here in this course. However, we are in the multivariate part, you may have asked yourself, well, this is a rather univariate technique. We have a response variable that's either continuous or um, nominal variable. So what is about multivariate regression trees? And this is what we can what we deal with now. We can easily extend this univariate regression tree to the multivariate case uh, by employing a multivariate response matrix, for example, in our context, this would mainly be a species matrix, and summing the impurity measure over the multivariate response. So the deviance that we used before, where we summed um, over the, the square distances that we used for one response variable to the mean, we just calculate the multivariate mean and calculate the distances. We have done this already. Uh, a, a couple uh, for different techniques in the in this course. If you think about the Malanobis distance, for example, which impurity measures are used? The impurity measures used are the sum of squares to the multivariate mean, but also you could use the median as well, the multivariate median, and you could employ distance-based metrics. So we have met already distance metrics in the previous sessions of this course. The new elements that arise for these multiple regression trees, so the whole fitting procedure and pruning procedure, splitting and pruning, uh, growing a tree is all very similar. Um, the new elements are that we can identify species that drive the splits. We have three B plots that display sites and species, and finally we can identify species that represent nodes. So we have here multiple regression trees. That's mean we mainly work with the abundances, and we look at the mean abundances um, of the species in the different nodes and look uh, which or whether a species is representative for a particular group or node. Another useful, useful um, related um, anal analysis is um, to compare this result for the multivariate regression tree and you could consider this as a constraint clustering, that means clustering under the condition of environmental variables, could compare this with under constraint clustering. So we build groups based on environmental variables and look whether we yield the same groups um, if we would not have this, um, uh, these environmental variables. And if the results of the grouping is very similar, then we could conclude that the most, environment, most important environmental variables seem to be captured in our data set. If the grouping is very different if, uh, for the unconstrained clustering, then the opposite would be concluded. And finally, this represents an alternative or a complementary technique to RDA and CCA to display species-environment relationships 
Um, and this is especially useful, again, as for the univariate case for nonlinear and complex species environment relationships. So let's look at two outputs uh, from multivariate regression trees. First of all, here is an overview of this regression trees. We see here the regression trees, the regression tree for different spider species and the relevance uh, of the individual or the, the, the conditions of the individual um, environmental variables. So we see in the if there are less than eight twigs, uh, eight percent probably in the data. Um, then we move to the left, and some species are then more present if we have less twigs and lower water content. We see that these two species are primarily present. Um, a star here means that these are indicator species. That means if these two species occur in high abundances, they indicate that you have a low water content and low number of twigs. And on the other hand, if you have high twigs, then these two species are particularly indicative um, of such environmental conditions and you could go through the remaining part of the tree to um, study this. And then you have a table and in this table you see as well um, the variance explained by different tree splits and by the whole tree and by the species total. So you can evaluate from such a table to which extent the individual species is well explained by the different tree splits and by which tree split. And we see that overall 80% of the species variance is explained of the total species variance and that um, the twigs split um, explains most of the species variance um, and followed by water less than 2.5. So that's it on the theoretical background of univariate classification and regression trees and multivariate regression trees. We will now implement these techniques in R. So we fire up R, you are used to that. And what we first do we is we load the library that we use for the modeling here. This is the R part library and we, we follow here an example of the modeling of pesticides data uh, and I've taken some parts of this example from Kuyan 2010. So we load the data here from the website. We have a quick look at the data and this data gives measurement of environmental concentrations of some toxicants and some additional physical chemical variables. Here some information on the position of the sampling sites and so on. So the data is not uh, we won't go through each of these columns, um, it's not that important for us here. Let's just take it that we have some environmental chemicals inside this data set. So the column with um, 49300 um, 49, is actually DeRone. That's a code that is given for environmental variables, environmental chemicals, uh, by the people who measure that. And we will first run a classification tree. And to do this, we convert the Dioron variable to a categorical variable. And this is done in the following lines. Based on the previous parts of the course, you should understand what's going on here. So we basically uh, construct a new variable that is called Dioron in the data set will data and we assign all of the values to below um, method detection limit. However, then we say 
if P49,300, so D your own, is larger than size um, approximately 7 microgram per liter, then we assign high. Um, this has been, uh, this classification is taken from Quian, uh, Quian's script, so he has decided on these uh, classifications, read more details in his book and script. And then we use the next condition, so smaller than 7 microgram per liter and, and larger than almost 1 microgram per liter as medium and so on. Finally, um, if we look at the number of observations, it's 95, so approximately 100 as well. So as I mentioned before, the, we use some cross-validation here and some splitting so we uh, to have the results reproducible, we set a seed before. We see also that this uh, command, this is actually the, the, the regression tree, or it's called air part for recursive partitioning. We see that it follows the same syntax as other air functions for linear or generalized linear modeling. Um, you find more information, of course, in the help. Um, if we have uh, um, factorial data which we just constructed we should employ here the method class otherwise R tries to guess our type of data so if you have a continuous variable it would automatically select um, a different type um, a different method unless we force or provide R with information which which uh, method to use and here we say that the minimum split in a node should be 10. And default would be 20. That means um, any node that is split has needs to have at least 20 observations. And we reduce this to 10. So how does the result look like? We see that we have we obtained such a tree um, with several splits. We see here that N23 relates to nutrients in the water body. That, that uh, for low nutrients we end up we rather end up with concentrations at the at the bottom here terminal nodes with a below method detection limit or low or medium concentrations. And here, if we have a uh, land use forest um, larger than 5.5%, um, then we end up here on this. And we move, to, if we have below 5.5, we move to the left side. If we have larger than 5.5 forest, um, we move to the right side, and so on. It's not that easy to interpret if you have. So, for example, how, how do we evaluate that we have, uh, when do we have below method detection limit? We have to go through all these interactions here. So, let's ta like, take a look at the cross validation error. We can plot the diagram. And as I mentioned in the theoretical part, we would look here what is the cross validation error against. The complexity parameter, we see that we reach the minimum for a tree size of 3 or 5. And we decide here to take this um, validate the cross validation error for tree size of 5. So this relates here to 5 terminal nodes, so means 4 splits. We could also look at the different numbers. Um, here we have yeah, numerically, we have the com cost complexity parameter, the number of splits and the cross validate, uh, the relative substitution error. 
and we have the cross validation error. You can use this information to calculate the absolute cross validation error. For a node, that means um, to calculate how many of the observations in this node are correctly classified and which ones are not approximate, uh, not correctly classified. So, for example, what we have here is 56 of 95 observations are incorrectly classified. So we have a we have an error of 60%. And if we calculate, if you multiply this uh, with 0.82, for example, uh, for the cross validation error, then we have um, an absolute error of 50%. So half of the cases would be incorrectly uh, classified if we split this tree into um, four nodes. And we see that the relative error, that's the simple substitution error, which doesn't take into account cross-validation, so only the full data set that this decreases, of course. So it's like in multiple regression, if you just add more variables, then we decrease, then we increase the explained variance, and this decreases, decreases the error. Um, this is the same here. If you look very subtle, you see that the complexity parameter varies between the plot and, and um, the PRINCIP function are different because the PRINCIP function um, reports the minimal complexity parameter um, for which the pruning is done and the other one, the geometric mean with the standard error. So we decide to prune the tree to 5, to the size of 5. This is done with the prune command. Select the, the, um, the resective tree and the complexity parameter that we have read from the figure. Let's quickly look at the finger, figure again. So here we could read um, <coughs> Here was actually 0 0.062. Um, choose here in a previous example that I run uh, for different data. Uh, this was 0 0.054 because I diff said there's different seed before. Um, so I choose this here to 0 0.06. We plot the data plot the results again and now we see that we have five terminal nodes and we have just uh, four splits and it's easier to interpret now. We see that still nutrients are most important, uh, land use forests, re land use residents and um, the latitude here decides whether we have low or medium. We see we have actually no group at the end uh, with high However, um, be aware, this uh, assignment of, of classes at the end, this is just the dominant classes, or the ones that have the highest proportions. You would still have some misclassified classes here that was uh, below method detection limit, medium or high. Um, and this is actually shown in a nicer plot. Um, you can use this function. Um, and here you see for the individual groups, so how often we have below method detection limit, how often we have low, how often medium, and how often we have high observations uh, in these different nodes. And we see that this node is actually relatively pure, so it has only one type, um, more or less one, or basically one class. Um, of observations, uh, for his is perfectly pure, only observations with low DRUN content, whereas we have here um, actually medium uh, is, is assigned to this node as, as, as group label because um, most of the sites have medium concentrations, but actually most more or less half of the sites 
uh, are high um, or low as well. We have also um, still a much nicer representation than this and this is from the party package we can convert the output to the party package and then have bars that are easier to interpret for us and give the proportion for different factor levels. So this is the type of plot we will continue to use now. We also can have a look at variable importance. So we have some measure of importance here that depends how often um, the variable, some variable is used to split and um, based on the goodness of split measure as well. I won't go to details here how this is measured, um, but you will. You, you, what we see is that mainly land use variables and the size of the water body are important. Nutrients and other variables are less important. We can also look, we get a similar information when we run the summary function. Uh, we have here more information on the different splits that occur just explain this for one split in a second. So we have here variable importance that looks differently from the numbers because it's standardized to 100, it's scaled to 100, so they add up to 100. Then we have the information on the individual nodes, uh, cost complexity parameters, the probabilities for the individual classes, how many observations we have from the different classes here, the own contents, um, and then the primary splits. So this is the split that has been used. The nutrient content and um, are also tests other splits, other variables for splitting and gives an information how good the deviance would be for these splits and tells how many missing values you have. And in case you have missing values, then you use alternative for these remaining observations where you can't use the nutrient information for splitting, then actually these are split on surrogate variables. And this is information is provided here, which one of the variables is used for these surrogate splits. And this is for each of the nodes below. Okay, so much about classification trees. We move on to the regression modeling. And here we can use the DRONE data as continuous response. We will nevertheless um, use the log transform data here. We see that it spans three orders of magnitude from minus 1.7 log minus 1.7 to 1.5, so relatively. Uh, almost three orders, four orders of magnitude. That's why we use log transformed data. So the syntax is the same here. We just removed the method argument. R is able to detect it, that it's a continuous variable and the rest of the command is more or less the same here. Just run that and we plot that. What we see is that, again, we have a relatively large tree that is difficult to interpret. Um, as I already explained in the previous theoretical part, in the, in the lecture part, um, you have the mean of the variable uh, now given, because it's a continuous variable, and calculate the mean and the number of observations in the node. So what we can learn from this is that we have particularly low concentrations of deuron if there is a large if there is a low land use residence uh, lower forested land use if there is um, um, depending on the nutrients and depending on agricultural land use if you have low agricultural land use so um, Nevertheless, the tree is quite large, so we proceed here uh, with the same in the same manner as we did for the classification trees. What we see here is that we don't reach a minimum. 
uh, the minimum would be somewhere here or somewhere here. Um, so we refit this model. We use um, a lower cost complexity parameter. If you look at the previous command, we didn't specify a cost complexity parameter that is by default set to 0 0.001. And here we set a much lower cost complexity parameter to have a longer chain in the, for this data set. So we run this again. To set seed command before, I plot this model again, and we see that we reach more or less a minimum here to the end. We have here a minimum at, at uh, size 15, it's slightly increasing. We could actually go even lower and run this again. I took this from the script. Here and we see that not much changes anymore to this end. So what we do now is uh, we see that once we reach a size of 3 of 6, we more or less reach a relatively stable um, cross-validation error. Again, it depends a little bit on what you want to do. If you uh, we have here, the dashed line actually represents the, the one standard error from the minimum cross-validation point estimate and you could choose the point, the first point within that. So we could go with um, three of the size four um, if we basically aim to have a meaningful interpretation and an easy interpretation of the smaller tree or if our aim is predictive accuracy, we could also select the cost complexity parameter um, here related to tree size six. We do this in this case and just following the analysis of Quian. So we prune the tree with the cost complexity parameter. We plotted the final tree with the party package. And we see that the output here is somehow different. We see here that we have now a box plot. Of course, we have a continuous response variable. So we have um, some uh, spectrum of observations. And we have um, Indicator we see that these observations increase from left to right in this case. We see that the main predictor is agricultural uh, land use. Again, here yeah, it's more than 74.5%. And if we have a higher ammonium content and again um, a high agricultural content then we have the highest urone concentration. So this makes perfectly sense. And if you compare this to the results from the classification trees, that was um, that makes somehow as a more, more plausible this result. So that is agriculture and ammonium. Ammonium could also be a proxy of agricultural input. Um, and the higher this is, um, the higher would be the pesticide concentrations as well. And we see here that land use forest is actually a proxy um, for splitting between very low and um, high concentrations. So here we have, if it's the land use is higher than 5.5%, then we have the lowest concentrations. And this must also perfectly sense. Um, just um, if you co compare this to the previous results, you see that the classification tree that somehow this was, um, a, a, then we obtained a different result that was not very plausible. Now let's check whether the Masan's assumptions are met. The regression tree is also a kind of regression model, so we have a look. Um, at the assumptions of such a model and we fit the predictions against residuals and we fit um, with the uh, 
if we look at the normal distribution of residuals, and that looks fairly okay. As I, or as in a theoretical part we stated, um, the model is more robust, um, and we see that it um, fits the assumption relatively well. So we restore the initial parameters. You can also look at variable importance. Here we see that again agriculture and nutrients are most important variables. Um, and if we compare this to the variable importance from the classification tree, we see that this differs quite a bit. So in terms of uh, agricultural land use is here most important, whereas this was um, forested land use. So and then, not, not, nevertheless, um, we see that consistently land use uh, is among the main predictor of the own concentrations. And finally, you have the same information instead of the instead of the um, you, the, the different proportions for the different classes you obtain here, the mean and the, as a deviance measure, the sum of squares, the mean sum of square error is provided here. So, and the different splits again. Now it's time for you to conduct this and you should conduct uh, regression tree analysis for the US air pollution data set. Um, However, I will still continue and show you the multivariate regression tree analysis. One problem is here that this package has been removed from CRAN because it has not been maintained anymore. Uh, you can still use it and install it, but it's not so easy. Um, so therefore, I, especially on Windows, it may be a little bit troublesome. Um, on Linux and Mac, it's, it's, it's much easier. I'll just show you here, just demonstrate you how this would look like is if you get this to run. Um, there are some information on the internet, uh, how to do this, how to get this done. So I just uh, load the multivariate partitioning package, the regression tree package, multiple regression tree package, and the spider data. So the spider data is the, is the data that, is, uh, that has, uh, really relates to the plots that I show you um, for multiple regression tree results in the, in the lecture part. And it gives the abundance uh, for different spiders, uh, for 12 different spiders and six environmental predictors. So we have a look. At the data, we see that the status spider abundances range from zero to a maximum for some spiders of nine. Um, they have relatively similar abundances. We can conclude from this and we extract this data. Yeah, and then we run the multivariate partitioning. What this command does is actually uh, it combines all the commands that we did before in the univariate case where we first had to run the tree or, or construct the tree, then had to, let, to look at the cost complexity parameter and prune the tree. And this uh, package, this function does did this all automatically. Here we select which cross validation uh, criterion whether we should use the minimum or the one standard error criterion um, to select the optimal pruning of the tree. So it's already done. Um, before we have a look at this tree, let's first have a look. Um, you see that here we have uh, different environmental variables. So the, the amount of herbs and the amount of twigs, the amount of sand in the habitat, um, and these are responsible for the different species. We see that the cross, vari cross variation error is relatively high. Um, so about almost 50% of the variance in the data set uh, when we use cross validation is 
not explained and the number of observations is relatively low in these in these groups so now let's see uh, for let's compare the data to a cluster analysis and we have on the one hand the multivariate regression tree according to size um, so the, the number of trees, uh, the number of nodes or terminal nodes obviously influences the, the um, resubstitution error that we mentioned before. And so if we use all the data, if we ignore cross-validation and we compare this to the solution from a cluster analysis, first of all, that starts with the group from the multivariate regression trees and one in blue that is done uncons completely uh, with, with random configurations and we see that the um, that the cross that the resubstitution error is relatively similar so there is not much more variance explained uh, this is k-means clustering here we've had this before in the course this k-means clustering explains a similar amount of variance um, as the multivariate regression trees based on environmental variables. So we could conclude here that most um, the most important environmental variables have been captured in by the multivariate regression tree or by, by when we um, collected the data. You could also run an interactive PCA plot for the tree nodes to aid in interpretation. So these are different nodes. Um, this is one node, this is one node. The nodes are, uh, have different colors here. And we see here um, that the different um, mean of the nodes and the individual sites that make up this node. Um, and this allows you to evaluate how the data, how the individual observations in these nodes are distributed. So how much variation there is in a node of the individual observations. We see this is a PCA plot. We have 70% um, explained in the first axis, 20% in the second axis. And apart from that, we can, ex uh, can explain, we can interpret this PCA plot similar to other PCA plots that we have before. For example, species that are closer along this first axis that are closer to the left uh, have higher abundances in these nodes and those that are occurring here in the other nodes. If you click here with the left button you can see the third dimension. You can click through the different dimensions here. If I click here you see also different dimensions displayed. If I put right click then I leave this or escape on other operating systems. So you could also, now we don't know which node actually is situated where in the tree. We can run our initial analysis, then we have colors at these nodes. Now we will see there's the environmental factors with uh, low herbs, low twigs and high sand is red. and relates to this um, piece. If we now click, we have a direct presentation of the species and sites again here. We have similar information as for the univariate case here, the cost complexity parameter, we have the observed information on the different splits provided here. However, trees are not very stable, as we have heard before. What you could done is to run multiple cross-validations, not, not, not just one, this whole procedure once, but several times. And for example, we do this here 100 times. We run this and um, then we obtain this result. We see that the cross-validation error compared to the first case we had, we had 45% or even higher. 47%. We have here decreased the cross-validation error 
a little bit by running this whole procedure 100 times. And again, the interpretation would be uh, very similar. Now let us finally inspect the residuals of this model. Here we see that we have a relatively good normal distribution. However, if we look at the predicted against residual fit, what we shouldn't observe a pattern, we see a clear increase. Well, why do we see this increase? Uh, this should be clear for you uh, from previous parts of this lecture. Well, we have abundance data. and The higher the abundance is, the higher the deviation can be. So we have here um, higher variability and we should actually use a Poisson data if we model um, abundances, uh, counts of species. Um, because, if, yeah, because we have not done this, um, uh, we have this increasing variability um, with the predictions. However, what we could do is we could standardize the data before, and that's what we do now. We standardize the data um, across sites and species and then inspect this again. So we fit the model again and we look again at the plot and we see now that this has become much better through standardization of our data. Well, you can also uh, look at more information. We have the, another library that extracts more information um, here we fit we obtain here the number some numbers as for the as it shown in the paper we see here how much um, the species uh, occurs for in the different splits um, some explained deviance and so on the sum of probabilities indicator values of the species, how much it is a species of a particular node, of, of course makes more sense for terminal nodes. Um, yeah, such information can be provided here. You can also plot this information. So here we have information how much deviance is explained um, and different parts uh, through different splits. And I just, this, is, this, is, this is just taken um, from the Numerical Ecology book. We look here um, where these species occur and we can create a table, for example, this is the table um, for the different nodes that show us how often these species and absolute abundances are occurring in the nodes and could relate this to environmental variables. Um, yeah, so this is overall, I think, a useful technique. It's a different approach than RDA and CCA. Um, it's especially in the case of when you have non-linear interactions and non-linear relationships to environmental variables or some complex interactions is easier to interpret with these types of plots and with that I thank you for joining this lecture and hope that you learned a little bit.